I'm Matt Haig, and this is the story behind my stories. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wine, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Matt Haig. Thanks for tuning in to Author Stories. I really appreciate you listening. If you go to hankgarner.com, you can go through all of the archives, more than 300 shows, author interviews with the very best people in publishing today. On the right-hand sidebar, there's places where you can subscribe uh, for just about every platform that you could possibly listen to the show on. I'd like to thank some sponsors today for their faithful support and for enabling us to bring you quality content like we do. Uh, Crystal Watanabe from Pico's House is uh, one of the best editors I've ever met and uh, whose work I really admire. She offers developmental editing, line editing, and beta reading. Uh, She's currently booking for May, so go ahead and send her uh, a message now to uh, get your project scheduled with her. She has four proofreaders on staff, so she can accommodate authors with a much shorter lead time than some other editors do. Uh, She's a new affiliate member of the SFWA and she comes recommended by best-selling authors such as Hugh Howey and Samuel Peralta. Uh, most of her experiences with science fiction, speculative fiction, and middle-grade fantasy, uh, but she really enjoys editing all genres and can really make your project shine. If you will mention author stories when booking uh, your editing services, you can receive a $75 discount on manuscripts over 60,000 in length or $25 discount on short stories. Pico's House, P-I-K-K-O-S-H-O-U-S-E. Please tell Crystal that you heard about it on Author Stories. Also, the Debt Collector series by Chuck Buddha. Debt is a death sentence. Michael Wright lives the American dream. He works hard every day but still lives paycheck to paycheck. The bills keep piling up and now his 10-year-old daughter requires surgery to save her life. Michael is in a race against time to find money, but how far is he willing to go? Is he prepared to do whatever it takes? Can he defeat a menacing evil that stands in his way? The Debt Collector series is a gripping tale of psychological horror, raising questions about our modern lifestyles and the terrifying possibilities that hit too close to home. One reader described it as if serial killers and Wall Street made friends. Pay up and die, delinquent, bankrupt. The Debt Collector series is available in paperback and ebook formats exclusively from Amazon or free through Amazon Kindle Unlimited. Walk Beside Me by Christine Handy. Willow Adair has a picture perfect life, or so it seems. A stunning model turned wife and mother, she lives in a beautiful home with her husband and two kids in historic Bexley, one of the wealthiest neighborhoods in Columbus, Ohio. On the outside, she has everything. On the inside, she struggles with issues of self worth, spurned by her neglectful husband and hated. By her rebellious teen daughter, Willow never feels she is good enough. She fears everyone she loves will leave. Walk Beside Me is the story of a woman who peels away the layers to find her inner warrior, a woman who faces insurmountable odds and, thanks to her earthly angels, learns to treasure the gift of God's infinite light and love. Walk Beside Me by Christine Handy Thank you to all of our sponsors for making the show possible. If you would like to sponsor the show, please go to HankGarner.com. And there's a link in the top menu bar where you can do that. At the end of the show, if you'll stick around, we're going to have an audiobook clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Uh, today, I'm really excited to have Matt Haig on the show with me. Matt has a brand new book out now everywhere called How to Stop Time. Uh, welcome to the show, Matt. Very nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, Matt, I begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or a storyteller? Well, that's interesting, because I always wanted to be a writer. Um, I always, in the sense that I always wrote stories, and, you know, my mum has got shoeboxes full of stories I wrote as like a five- and six-year-old. Um, full of stuff, whether it's about cowboys or 
Star Wars or science fiction, whatever it was, and I used to sort of draw my own pictures and write. So I was, I've always been writing. I think I didn't have the ambition necessarily to be a published author until much, much later, for all kinds of reasons, mainly because I didn't have the confidence in myself needed to sort of imagine my own name on a book or anything like that. So that was probably deep into my 20s before I started to think about that. But um, yeah, writing has always been, along with reading, it's always been something I, I, I wanted to do. And later on, it became something I needed to do. It was a sort of kind of therapy for me. Um, so yeah, it goes back as far as I can remember, really. And and God bless those uh, early days of just wanting to be a writer and to tell stories without all of the uh, the complications of, of having to make it a career. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. And, and it's very hard um, when, when it is a career to sort of try and get into that mindset. But I, I still try and do that. I still try and imagine I'm just sort of doing this as a hobby and just, you know, playing around because – if you treat it as play, then it becomes better. You write better if you're sort of enjoying what you're doing. Exactly, exactly. Um, you said that uh, that you didn't really consider making a making a career of, a, of it until uh, you were in your twenties. What was the the catalyst that uh, that got you thinking like that? Um, well, it was actually, you know, not to turn this into a therapy session or anything, but I had, I had had experience with sort of mental health problems in my 20s with anxiety and depression. I had a kind of breakdown when I was 24 years old. It was a very long, painful experience in my life that lasted about three years of being very unwell. And during my recovery, one of the things that really helped me a lot was reading and writing. And um, I wasn't particularly writing stories at that point. Um, I was sort of more writing down what I was feeling and it was a lot of it would be quite unreadable and quite painful to read now but it was a, a way of externalizing internal pain it was almost like having having an operation and having something removed out of you it wasn't like a magic cure it didn't instantly make everything better but it made everything feel like it could be managed but I don't know there's something about putting thoughts into language because language is a shared thing that I think is quite healing and I think this is one of the reasons why um, talk therapy is is so effective um, it's just that process of voicing something that's very internal and I think books and stories can do the same way even fiction can do the same things I think uh, you know every time we connect with fiction it's not because it's something um, totally fantastical that we can't relate to. It's something that feels true to us. And sometimes you have to go um, into fiction to, to get to those truths, I think. Well, um, a, a lot of your writing seems to deal with, uh, uh, with, with those issues of kind of coming to grips and coming to terms with yourself and uh, wrestling with, uh, you know, some darker things that, that we don't like to talk about in polite company. Um, it, you said that, that uh, in, including a memoir that you wrote that was extremely powerful. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you, uh, you said that that's what really helped you that through that was writing and reading. Uh, did you find any other, uh, books or stories that uh, that you were able to connect with in the same way that you hope people connect with your books. Yeah, I mean, uh, like when I was when I was ill um, with um, depression and stuff, uh, I found it quite hard to read directly about depression. So a lot of the things that comforted me at that time were books I'd already read. So there were books I'd read as a child or as a teenager, you know, whether it was everything from Catcher in the Rye to Winnie the Pooh. I was a big Essie Hinton fan, so all those kind of books. Books that I just knew intimately, and so there was a sort of comfort in the familiarity of them. So I'm a great fan of rereading favorite books. I think books, you know, not to be too sentimental about it, but they're kind of like friends that we keep on the shelf and they, we can sort of pull them out in times of need and uh, you know I didn't need anything too challenging at that time I needed I needed to be sort of comforted um, by stories and I think I think there is something comforting about it and, and stories because if you think about what a um, story is for a story to be a story something has to change it can be a character going through a change it can be a situational change um, but essentially with a story we expect some kind of change and when you're ill with anything but certainly when you're ill with depression 
um, you very much feel stuck in the same moment. So it, it's almost a it's almost like a religious experience. You have faith in this idea of change and transformation and i think stories give us that in a sort of subconscious way they give us the idea of change and redemption it doesn't even have to be a positive change but the idea of change is a very powerful thing when when you're real i think right uh you've written a number of novels for adults and a number of books for children uh and then uh right before your newest book you you wrote this memoir that we mentioned a minute a minute ago reasons to stay alive uh what was the what was the motivation for writing the memoir um well yeah it was kind of a difficult book to write because obviously it was very personal i mean i think memoirs are always difficult to write because you're not just writing about yourself but there are other people there, like my parents were in it, and um, it's somewhere between a memoir and a self-help book, I suppose. I'm a bit suspicious about the term self-help, but it, it, it's somewhere in that ballpark. Um, and yeah, it, it was the only book I've, I've written something like 14 books now. Some of them have been published here, some of them haven't. Um, but it was the only book I've written that um, I've been prompted to write um, by, by someone else. Um, someone asked me to write it. It wasn't my publisher. It was a friend who works in publishing, but nothing to do with my publisher. But she, she's had her own experience of depression. I had written a blog called simply Reasons to Stay Alive that had had quite a big and warm and supportive response. Um, that gave me confidence as well. And I'd had all these sort of barriers and uh, difficulties getting to the point of writing it. But when I was actually writing it, it was the quickest and easiest and um, simplest book I've ever written, really. And I wrote it very, very quickly. Um, people always say, oh, was it painful to go back there? And I was worried about that, too. But actually, it wasn't at all. Because when you've been through something traumatic, whatever it is in your life, it's kind of always there at some level. So you're always going back there. You can be lying awake at five in the morning thinking about stuff and you're back there. So in a way, writing felt like a letting go. It felt like sort of a release rather than a return, if that, if that makes sense. And so, yeah, it was very fast, very cathartic. The thing I found difficult about it is since it's been published, and in the UK it became my biggest book, it was sort of like number one, and it, it was in the bestseller charts for a while, which is obviously great, and it's everything you want as a writer. But because it was that book and my most personal book, and it wasn't a novel, um, I, found, I felt suddenly exposed because I wrote it thinking almost no one was going to read it, and maybe a select few people who were, who were very ill. But all kinds of people read it. You know, It wasn't people who were just ill. It was people who, who maybe knew someone who wanted to help their son or daughter or husband or whoever it was who was going through that. And so that that was quite difficult because, like, I I wasn't writing it. And the, the reason I'm suspicious of self-help books is I often feel that they're um, written almost from a mountaintop, like they've got all the answers on there. Here you go. Here are your rule, rules for life. And I, I definitely wasn't writing it from that perspective. I was writing it as someone who was in a better place than where I was, and I had my own story, but it, it was more of a case study. It was more of an experience that I went through. And... So when I was, uh, after it had been published and I was still getting little bouts of anxiety or something, I, I would be getting all these emails saying, oh, thank you, you saved my life, da, da, da. And I was thinking, oh, well, why do I still feel, <laughs> sometimes why, why do I still feel like a mess? You know, when, when, when so why, why can't it work for me? So, so I had that sort of moment of doubt and crisis about it. But I, I've gone past that now and I, I'm pleased. I, suppose, I don't think it's my best book, but I think out of everything I've written, it's probably the one. I'm, I'm proudest of in the fact that it's been useful to people. It's had some sort of practical use, which isn't often the case, certainly when you're writing fiction, but it, it, it's been useful in that way. So that, you know, I can't, I can't, I, I've come to terms with that now and I'm glad I've, it's out there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, which, which brings us to your new book that uh, as, as of recording this, uh, it, uh, it, it went on sale here in the U.S. Uh, yesterday or when, when folks are listening to this, it will have been out for a couple of days. And um, I received a copy of this from your publisher and from, uh, from Kristen. Uh, God bless her. Uh, she's so, so wonderful to work with. Um, but I got a copy of this and the cover immediately intrigued me. I opened it up and I started reading. And then the next thing I know, I had lost like seven hours, just fell face first into this book. Um, the, the character of Tom Hazard, uh, I, I was immediately 
um, uh, mesmerized by uh, the the type of book this is, but the way you tell this kind of story is completely backward uh, in a great way uh, from what you kind of come to expect from this time hopping uh, kind of almost supernatural story. Uh, who is Tom Hazard and how did he come into your life? Well, Tom Hazard is someone who, who outwardly looks like an ordinary 40 year old um, history teacher living in London, but actually he, he he's not. He's 439 years old. He was born in, 1581 he um, has a very rare condition known as anagaria um, which for the purposes of the book it's a condition where you age very slowly you still age you're not immortal but for every 15 normal years you only age one biological year so he's um, he's very impossibly old and he has, being that age, he has known a lot of grief in his life. Um, everyone he's loved, he's lost. And um, he, he's had lots of dark times. And we meet him in quite a sort of dark point in his life. And it's his story of how he learns to let go and embrace the present and be sort of brave enough and have the courage to kind of love again and risk that hurt again. And it's about what you would do in that situation if you literally knew everyone you were going to sort of love or care for in your life, you were going to lose. I mean, we all face that to a certain extent, but I was just sort of exaggerating something that is a, a normal human thing about, you know, the price of love and the price of grief and everything. Um, how did you decide to, uh, on the, the time span that this book is set in, uh, why did you choose 1500s to present? Uh, were there specific historical events that you wanted uh, to highlight and to touch on? Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, one reason, though, was because oh, it sounds ridiculous when you're writing a story about a um, 400 and 39 year old man but I, I, I wanted to make it relatively within the book I wanted to make it relatively feasible relatively realistic and um, as I was doing my research I felt like well if he's like 2,000 years old that, that takes it into a whole different level of fantasy if, if we do it sort of un, under 500 years you know there are living creatures who do live that long yeah, recently there was a time magazine article and um, all kinds of reports in scientific publications about these sharks they've discovered around greenland greenland sharks they're called and they, they've carbon dated them and, and they actually found out they're a thousand years old and there's these clams that they've discovered that are over 500 years old and all kinds of sea creatures so, so obviously it's it's an unrealistic length for a human to live, but I thought so long as there were living, breathing creatures beyond that, um, it would be relatively plausible. And then within those sort of 500 years, I was partly cherry picking my favorite, most interesting periods, whether it was um, early Hollywood, like 1920s Los Angeles, whether it was um, Shakespearean London, whether it was Paris in the 19. Uh, 20s, New York in the 1890s, all, all kinds of um, periods that have fascinated me. I mean, obviously, it ha it's Tom's story, so it has to serve Tom's purpose. But rather than follow Tom year by year by year, I was I was more trying to um, replicate the idea of memory. You know, we don't remember things chronologically. So if Tom's walking along a street in London something will sort of flash back in his mind and he'll think of something and it's it's a, it, it has a logic to it the, the structure of a story but it's not a chronological logic it's kind of um emotional and it sort of makes sense in tom in tom's mind so i was pick, picking certain areas certain things um the only other thing i would say is some things were sort of like practical points for the plot like for instance i did not want to write a book that was 500 years of English history or 500 years of London history. I wanted to get Tom out of England. And so obviously for most of his life, there weren't airplanes or means to do that other than by going out on a, on a ship. So um, halfway through his life, he, he goes off on Captain Cook's second voyage and um, travels the seven seas and goes to Tahiti and 
it goes to the southern hemisphere and stuff and also in um the 1800s he, he goes to america so i was very determined that as well as having a breadth of time there'd be a sort of breadth of place to it as well um other than the the time and place elements that you wanted to touch on what were some of the um the the personal uh circumstances that you wanted to wrestle with uh with tom in this book what sort of um what sort of uh personal growth uh things did you want to put Tom into to see how he would react? Um, well, I, I thought it would be quite neat. I mean, there's lots of horrible things he goes through. I mean, I, I thought it'd be quite a ni- nice idea to, to have, have him have to keep his condition secret. So when, when he was younger, he was in an age which believed in witchcraft and superstition. And this affects not just himself, but people he knows. So he learns from an early age to have to keep it secret, which I thought was a nice metaphor for all kinds of things, obviously for sort of like mental illness and other things which which have stigma and people keep quiet about. And so a lot of his, a lot of the sort of challenge for Tom is, is keeping it secret. And it's one reason why he has to move around, because obviously if you are staying in one place with the same people, they will eventually realize you aren't aging or not aging in a normal way. So every eight years or so, he has to move about. So he, he, he literally is this rolling stone trying to gather no moss for most of his life. And in the present moment, he's at a turning point. He's in London. Um, he's decided out of everything he could be, and he could be almost literally everything because he's he's now part of this... Uh, It's called an albatross society. It's a society of people like him, very long-lived people who have anageria, who are hundreds of years old. And it's run by this sort of kind of sinister guy called Hendrik. And he he, he basically puts people where they want to be and and sort of arranges, has all kinds of ways of arranging things to happen. And the thing Tom has chosen is to be a history teacher in present-day London in a public school in not a very nice part of London either. And I like the idea that, given this world of infinite choice, you know, rather than be in some lemon grove in Sicily, rather be, than be on some desert island living a life of luxury, he's actually trying to do something useful with his time now, and he, um, he, he becomes a history teacher, which is the most obvious thing for him to be, as he himself is history. So what better way to bring history life and someone who actually is history but obviously it makes keeping who he is secret a little bit harder now he's surrounded by more people but uh, yeah that that was that was the sort of starting point really this history teacher who himself is history we uh matt we think of the the typical arc of life uh you know, about 70 to 80 years old. Uh, and we have uh, certain preconceived stages of life. Uh, you know, we're, we're going to fall in love in our, in our 20s. We're going to get married. Uh, after that, we're going to start having a family. We're going to be really responsible in our 40s and 50s. And, and, and then we're going to have grandchildren. And we're going to start our slow decline and watch our families uh, take on from us. Um but now we, we have more and more people that are, are hoping and wishing that that we can extend life and we can keep pushing those boundaries out. Um, in a, a character like Tom, who is robbed, uh, so to speak, of that typical life arc, and, and he doesn't get to experience what the rest of society is experiencing, um, how do you think his story uh, may help us wrestle with what it means to live longer and is living forever something that we really want? Well, yeah, I mean, that was the kind of therapeutic aspect for me was looking at this because um, I'm someone who is a naturally quite neuro- neurotic person. I'm quite a hypochondriac. I get into terrible little spirals of thinking I've got various ailments and illnesses. You know, the sort of writer cliche of a sort of, neurosis right. ridden person <laughs> right i may um, i may have eight eight different strains of the flu right now right yeah exactly <laughs> you know i woke up, i woke up with a little bit of a sore throat this morning i thought okay here we go um so i i think it was quite therapeutic to actually look at 
the opposite. Look at look at the fantasy, looking at most long life and actually seeing especially if not everyone is doing it. If if it's if it was just you alone, you know, what would that feel like? And um, you know, I, I think I think it would be a curse as much of a blessing. And I, I I've you know, in researching this book I saw lots of interviews with normally old people, you know, in their seventies and eighties and they say you know, there's a lot of good things about getting older. The hard thing about getting older, one of the hard things is um, how you keep things fresh, how you think, keep things new. If you think about a lot of people's favorite songs or favorite books or favorite films, they're often things they watched in their sort of younger half or experienced in their younger half of their life um, when, when th- things start more intense. So to, to, to not have that, not just a physical fading away, but to not have that sort of emotional fading away, I think... Um, would become a challenge beyond the sort of normal human time span and how how you stop that feeling like you're just repeating everything. Like, um, you know, maybe there's something about a normal length of human life that that is natural, that is is exactly gives us the right time to explore who we are. And once we start pushing that beyond, I think there'll be all kinds of challenges. And then, of course, there's going to be ethical considerations because there are, you know, the, as you know, there are these sort of Silicon Valley firms and all kinds of biotech firms around the world who are looking at trying to um, artificially um, make us immortal. And obviously when this, if and when this actually happens, it will be the very, very super rich who first have access to this. So it will, it will create an even more unequal society and with the sort of swelling population it will create you know all kinds of questions and issues about um population growth and you know the strain that will put on things um so yeah it was it was fun exploring that because you know obviously we we all like it you know the idea of living forever but when you actually pay it close attention there are a lot of questions that are interesting to explore yeah um how to stop time is uh, is releasing here in the states uh, right now, and uh, a, a lot of people are going to be discovering this wonderful story. But this book has been out for uh, six months or so uh, in in the UK, I believe, and you already yeah. have some uh, some great film news about it. Would you like to share some of that with us? Yeah, the film's been out for a while in the UK. It's been uh, well. It's still, I think, uh, we find out today if it's still still in the top ten. But it's been a bestseller for a few weeks now as well. And yeah, the film news. Film news. I heard very early on. It was quite surreal because I hadn't actually finished writing the book. I was onto my third draft of the book um, when I got a phone call from my publisher who said that a certain actor by the name of Benedict Cumberbatch had. Um, wanted to buy the film rights for it and um he not only that but he wanted to play the central character tom hazard and so yeah that's that's that, that's what's happening it's um it's optioned by his company sunny march um and they they've got benedict attached to play the main character they've got a great writer called anthony mccarton writing the script and he's the guy who um wrote Darkest Hour, you know, the uh, Churchill film that's out at the moment, and he wrote a fil- film about Stephen Hawking a few years ago. So they've got great people on it. I think, truth be told, they don't want me to have much involvement on that side, and I am perfectly happy to take a back seat because, well, for one thing, to protect my sanity, because I think as a writer, when you get the sort of film rights sold and then you get too involved in the process, it can be a bit... Um, especially if it didn't end up happening for whatever reason or um, you were, got pulled in every which way and all of that. I, th- I think for your sanity, it's best to just focus on the next story, the next book, and keep writing that way. But I am very, very confident that they will do a better job than I would be able to do anyway. So uh, I'm very happy just sort of letting it be and letting it progress. And the wheels are turning nicely at the moment. I think they have at the stage where they've just finished the um, first draft of the script. They haven't shown it to directors yet, but that will be coming hopefully at some point this year. So, yeah, it's exciting times. Well, uh, Matt, I'm uh, I'm super excited for everyone to to get a copy of this book. Um, what a gift it was to read it! Thank you for writing it. Um, if people are just discovering you uh, for the first time, where can they find you online and and follow along uh, with your adventures and exploits? 
Well, I've got a website, which is just my name, matthaig.com, but I, I spend a lot of time, actually too much time probably, on social media, so like Twitter and Facebook. Twitter in particular seems to be my my um, thing as my sort of a counterbalance to writing a novel. I occasionally switch over to Twitter and start, I don't know, ranting about something. That's Matt Haig dot, uh, no, not Matt Haig dot, Matt Haig one, um, because the original Matt Haig was taken apparently. So H A I G is Haig, and yeah, I'm over on Twitter. Excellent, uh, Matt. Thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. Thank you so much. That was really great. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to HankGarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there. I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. They reverently slipped Jason's giant size X-Men number one from its Mylar protector. Drinking in the sweet aroma of browning paper and three-color process that signals only the best and rarest and most wonderful of collectibles. On one page, Professor X raised his fingers to his temples and rallied his X-Men his psychic commands radiating from his bald head like waves off hot asphalt. I have psychic powers, Owen blurted. I want Wolverine's claws. Jason was turning a page. Snick! Or, hey, get this, get this. Lightsabers poking out the backs of my hands. Or even, no, no, I'm totally serious. I have psychic powers. No, you don't. I do. Jason laid the comic on the bedspread. He sighed. Owen could be such a spaz sometimes. Okay, he said indulgently. What number am I thinking of? Stop, it doesn't work that way. What I can do is called a psychic reading, off an object, like getting impressions. When the doorbell rings, if I put my hand on the knob, as soon as I do, I know who's there. It's called looking through the peephole, moron. Shut up! And when I touch the phone, I know who's calling. I'm sure, Mr. Bullshit from Bullshit Mountain. Like my sister or my grandmother, I just know it's them. There's no such thing as psychics. Okay, you try. Don't be stupid. Are you chicken? Fine! Okay. He snatched up a brown paper bag, spotted with grease, and dumped a few stale french fries into the trash can. I'll put an object in this bag, and you try to guess what it is. Turn your back. Jason did and heard a rustling behind his head. Okay, you can look now. Owen produced the bag. It was rounded with some object now. Don't touch yet, just think. Try to imagine what's inside. Your lunch? Jason sneered, but he closed his eyes and tried to imagine. He could hear Owen's breathing. Jason's nose itched. His brain grew bored with nothing to look at, and fragments of images swam in and out of his imagination. Strawberry, he blurted. Owen reached into the bag, producing a white bowl. Jason had eaten frosted flakes from it about three days ago. A few stuck to it, like little beige fish scales. See? I lose. No, look here. Owen pointed. A design went around the sides of the bowl. A long string of vines and painted fruit. With strawberries. That's... Jason began, but didn't know how to end the sentence. It's cool. See? What did I tell you? Do it again. Jason closed his eyes. An image like daisies and sun and... Yellow, he blurted after three seconds. Oh my god, open your eyes! Owen held a bright yellow highlighter pen. I hadn't even put it in the bag! And so they went, for thirty minutes or more. A staple remover, a toy soldier, a sweat sock, a pencil. Jason never said precisely what was in the bag, but it was always close or related. He'd imagine a cockpit, and Owen would produce a game controller. He'd say plate, and the object would be a CD. He made right angles with his pointer fingers, shrugging, only to have Owen pull out Eliza's knitting needles. His friend became more and more enthusiastic, but Jason became a little scared. You have a real gift, Owen said. You're, like, brilliant. Owen babbled for a long time about astral projection and ESP, how Jason was picking up signals from Owen's own psychic powers, which had obviously been doing the broadcasting. 
Owen left that night full of plans and experiments, vindicated in his beliefs. Jason sat on the bed after Owen left, thinking hard. He had no explanation for what he'd done, but he knew he hadn't faked it. He couldn't believe, but he couldn't deny, either. Essence, Book One, Septima. The first volume in the exciting new science fiction series by Nick Breaker. Troy is no longer himself. Kidnapped by aliens infected with the essence of the dead General Tomas, Troy grasps at his only hope of survival. He merges his soul with the alien parasite trying to possess him, leaving him forever changed, and not entirely for the worse. Once plagued by crippling phobias, Troy is now fearless, willing to fight his enemies with his bare hands. But with his new strength also comes a new weakness, women. Tomas was notorious for his insatiable desires, and Troy finds himself constantly resisting temptation, especially the gorgeous, manipulative Alta. Although Alta has convinced the Pyrrhans she's helping them prepare to battle the murderous Reptarans, she's actually meticulously planning to steal their ultimate power source and then abandon them to their fate. Alta won't hesitate to kill anyone in her way, and her deep love for Tomas is Troy's only advantage. He convinces Alta that Tomas has taken full control of his being and thus keeps her trust and his life. While Alta schemes, Troy covertly struggles to save the Pyrrhans and prevent the Reptorans from invading Earth. But first, he must wrest back control of his own soul. Essence, Book One, Septima, the first volume in the exciting new science fiction series by Nick Breaker. Find it on Amazon today. There's a link in the show notes.